Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back. It's Will and John here, back for the UFC 245 edition of the MMA Huddle. Uh, this is the big one. This is uh, the big, big pay-per-view to finish off the year. Um, I know we've got South Korea next week, but this is the, the big card to really finish off 2019. Three title fights, some literal legends on the main card as well, and then they put solid matchmaking throughout the prelims and the UFC Fight Pass prelims. Before we get into saying hello to John and um, talking about some fights help us uh, grow the channel hit that sub button, hit the bell and be notified when our videos are, are on uh, YouTube we're also going to be doing a live chat probably after Christmas in, uh, before New Year uh, keep an eye, we might try and see if we can schedule it for a certain time and uh, go from there, so come and join us in that, you can have a little bit of hijinks with us on a live stream and uh, just ask us some questions or throw any of opinions our way, just anything really, a fight chat regarding the year, what's been, what's coming in 2020, uh, you name it, if you've got a question, just throw it in it and we will try and um, get that answered for you. But like I say, come and join us for that and see where we are. Coming off uh, the Washington card at the weekend, um, <clears throat> we're mm. like pretty decent considering, um, I, th I actually really enjoy cards that have had a break before it. I, I, that's the one thing I miss about Going back a few years, but the Yoshi some type fight cards used to have like two weeks off and it build your anticipation and then you're ex more excited to see the kind of UFC back. And that kind of ended with uh, Alistair Rowan kind of getting his lip absolutely <laughs> destroyed by uh, Rosenstruck, which is kind of crazy off one strike how, how much damage that did. So, uh, yeah, like I said, we're going to start talking UFC 245 one little second now. I'm just going to ask John how his weekend was because I know there was fights aplenty and... Uh, Looking ahead to this card, I think we're in for a bit of a treat. Yeah, this this is the card I've been looking forward to. Last week was oh sorry, last week this weekend just gone. It was like a warm up really, just getting everyone back in the mood, getting the mood again, get everyone's attentions back on the uh, fight game. And this is the only card I'm I'm thinking about. There's too many fights on here that I'm too excited about, the, and it's I, I just can't wait. This is this is this is a pay per view. This is a pay per view mm. card, and I think that if you're a fan of MMA, this is what you're putting money on. This is a card you pay for. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, when you look at, like, um, just say the boxing that we had, the Ruiz and yeah. Russia, that's really a one-fight card. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm a boxing fan. Maybe I'd, maybe if I was a boxing fan, I'd maybe recognise more of the names or whatever. But, uh, like I say, sometimes you get people moan about this is not pay-per-view quality, this is pay-per-view quality. This is something you, you're going to be invested in. This is something you should put your money into um, if you choose to do that. Loads of people don't do that, and I don't mind that people don't do that. But, hey... Uh, yeah, we're, we're, like I said, we're going to get into it right now. We're going to start off in the middleweight division. We're going to start with Punahili Soriano against uh, Oscar Pijota. And John's going to get started on it. Yeah, I like this matchup uh, for Oscar more than um, Punahili. I think that he's, from the Dana White Contender Series, outside of the outside of Dana White Contender Series, had a couple of good fights. Oscar's lost a couple of fights. I know he lost a fight to uh, Rodolfo Vieira, but we, we both saw that. You know, he is a... He is just basically a Paul Jarez at middleweight. Just stout, kind of strong, absolute grappler monster. But it's weird, Oscar is a really good jiu-jitsu practitioner. <laughs> That's, like, there are levels to the game of jiu-jitsu. And I know that Oscar's um, not had the best of luck with his bouts, where he's lost with two submissions. And it looks like he isn't that good at jiu-jitsu, but if you look at the guys he lost in his mount bouts, bouts too, Gerald Mershak is a fantastic jiu-jitsu practitioner himself. He's a very good practitioner. Now, Oscar did tire himself out a bit in that one. He basically won the first round, and I thought that he just possibly gassed himself out a bit too much. Gerald Mershak is a guy who's got a good kind of um, toughness about him. To, he's durable. I think Oscar, in this fight, he's fighting a kid who's hittable, but also... You get this fight to the ground. I think this is when Os when Oscar can actually really start to perform a lot better. And I think it's the kind of fight he should do. I think uh, Sorino is going to throw strikes at Oscar where there's going to be openings for the counters. I don't think his striking is the cleanest. He's there to be hit. He does you know, show some decent cardio, but I think that Oscar, for my money and my, my opinion, especially when you lose two in a row, 
you've got to get that third win. You can't go out there and lose lose three in a row. I think Oscar's going to get the submission win in this one. I think he's going to get the grappling aspect involved. You know, don't don't bother blowing his gasket. He can. He's got a good hand. He's got good power in his hands, Oscar. He can hit people and hurt them, but there's no need to hit him. Get the kid down and then just use your grappling aspect, your, your high level, you know, gra- grappling jujitsu, and get the submission. And I think Serena was uh, kind of uh, susceptible p- potentially for the takedown and getting submit. So with a high level guy like this, so I'm going to go with Oscar. Even though he's on a two-fight uh, losing streak, I'm going to go Oscar's submission. Yeah, I'm with you on Oscar. I, I think, when I look at Soriano, uh, super aggressive, but I think that's going to be the downfall in this fight. I think that he's going to be so aggressive that he's going to play into Pajota taking him down. And I, then when I think it gets there, I think that's when Pajota can start showing some of the skills he has on the ground. Now, I know like you said it as well. It's like he's lost his last two fights via submission. I thought he was doing fine in that Meerschart fight until he got caught. Um, the Vera one, he is just, he's one of those awkward guys because you know if he gets you down that you're in a lot of trouble. But in saying that, he had taken down two, three times. Uh, he got passed on a little bit, but he still managed to find his way back to his feet on occasions as well. Um, but I, I just, uh, when you look at Soriano, big power obviously, mm-hmm. can blast you out. Like the fact, I think it was Jamie Pickett, I think uh, his last fight, the Dana White Contender Show, where he went, I want to say it was the 50 minute um, time limit in that one. So the 50 minutes, that's going to help him a lot. But there's a lot of experience on the side of Pahoa. I mean, he came up through Cage Warriors, he won the belt there. He's a uh, two and two in his UFC tenure. He's got none of these, um, he's not going to have any nerves. He's probably got nerves on his side for the simple reason that he knows he probably needs to win this one because three losses in the UFC, especially in a row, is kind of frowned upon in the UFC these days. So. I think he's going to use a kind of grappling, aggressive kind of game plan for this one. Try and not get into swinging matches with, with Soriano because he does have fighting and power just by seeing him uh, on the regionals. But I think Pohota has definitely got an advantage down the ground and uh, that's where I think he wins this fight. So I'm going to take Oscar Pihota, uh probably via submission, late second, early third round in that one there. So moving on, Jessica I against Viviani Arujo. Uh, good. I, I've liked the Rougeau since she came into the UFC. I thought uh, I spe- it was more, I, I can't really say liked since she came into the UFC because I picked against her on her first UFC fight, but that was because she came in so short notice yeah. against Santos. I think it was a Bern- uh, Bernardo. Um, uh, Bernardo. Um, that I just didn't see like the, the preparation, but she came in uh, G'd up for that fight, absolutely ready to go, and she put an absolute beating mm. on yeah. um, on, on our opponent there and, and got the stoppage and that's something you don't kind of overly see especially in short notice like I, I, I thought she she looked really really good really light on her feet varies up her attacks very well high output really good um, accurate striking a little bit kind of worried she fades off a little bit but she is facing bigger goals because she's fought down I think at 115 before mm. so she's moving up and she's facing these bigger goals and she's going to have people that are trying to take her down because her striking is really, really good. But she's actually the one that did that. Like I, I thought Alexis Davis might look for a grappling heavy takedown game. Didn't happen. Really kind of back and forth striking affair. But she really changed it up with her uh, with some of her takedowns as well. She did it in the Bernardo fight. She took down Bernardo and um, really surprised with that. Jessica, I, I think uh, obviously she's come back after that devastating loss back in the summer to Valentina where I mean there's just levels to the sport and she was at a level that she, she'll she probably never ever be at or never be in contention to be around that level she, I think she did well enough to get herself a UFC title fight she's got a big big fight here to really I think to, to beat Arujo because Arujo looks if she puts if she puts it all together I just don't see her um, getting takedowns I think which I think she might look for she's did that in the past but I think her striking, she's just at a little bit of a speed disadvantage. And I think that Arujo is going to be cutting off the cage and just making it difficult for Jessica to really set her feet down and, and land power strikes. Even though her striking, I don't think it's all bad. I just think Arujo's quicker, uh, lighter on the feet. Like I say, she, she, cut, um, she gives you better angles for her strikes. And I just think that she maybe wants to, maybe, maybe wants this more than what Jessica will kind of want. She's maybe hit a peak in the UFC and 
what's she going to do? Maybe try and get back up there to face Valentina again. She doesn't want to face Valentina again. Valentina will just kick her head off like she did um, the first time around. So uh, I've got Arujo. I think she, over the 15 minutes um, of the fight, I, I just think she's she's cleaner, she's slicker. She doesn't get hit as much uh, as what Jess Kai will. And uh, she wins the fight here. And seeing that, Jess I did reel off three wins in a row. Um, but and I mean over Chikagin who's up next for Shevchenko um, that was a close split which I, yeah. I can't think maybe Chikagin maybe should have got so um, yeah I, I'm going on Viviana Rujo via UD here I like the, I, I like both of them in this fight I think uh, Jessica the question is I suppose how does she come back and perform after the head kick stoppage mm-hmm. you know if you get you get starched like Shevchenko starched yeah as you know, well, we've seen it. It can change fighters. You know, they 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 they're not the same. They're not maybe they're a bit gun shy because they feel like they're exposed. You know, Jessica, I will be perform. You know, she'll be all talk about. She feels great. She feels confident. I'm going to do this, but you, you, we don't know what's going on inside her head. So I'm always a bit tentative, especially when a fighter has a big kind of stoppage like that in their career. And Viviana is, she is kind of just coming on leaps and bounds, and surprisingly catching everyone out really in this division she's quick Will like you said that is a huge factor speed kills and even in the flyweight division which is quick the flyweight division is a fast division she's a basically like say a straw weight coming up like uh, Joanna Jacek did and just super fast you know that she's so quick in that division she's catching girls out with her speed and it and it works because she, she's not she's not trying to knock you out she's just trying to basically beat you a volume on a judge's scorecard that wins because most fights in the UFC in the women's flyweight division not all of them but the high majority are going to make the decisions and that's how basically I, I, I imagine most, most girls in their flyweight division will will train to finish the fight but they will te- they will game plan to win the decision they'll game plan to get two re- first two rounds and then after that just try and keep keep momentum going. And I think this is where you're going to see it here. I think Viviana's going to get the first two rounds. I think Jessica and I is going to have a bit of a difficulty with catching the speed, getting back in the groove again. The confidence might be lacking a bit in the first half, in the first half of the fight. Set the third round, Jessica Rice, she's got good conditioning. That's one thing you can't take away from Jessica Rice. She is very well conditioned. She's She has got a good kind of temperament in fights. She kind of sticks to her game plan. She doesn't go off, off script. So I think in the third round, you might see Jessica Rye get a bit more of a performance out of herself. But I do go with Viviana. Because I'm like you, Will. I think Jessica Rye, you know, she, she talked about being the champion, being the, going for the title. She got a title shot. But at the same time, it's she's not a UFC champ. She really isn't. Um, I think maybe previously back in the day when, it, when, when she was competing outside of the organization, when she was... A 125er for Bellator. I think at that time, if the UFC had a 125, then she possibly could have transferred over very well and been a 125 champ. I just think she's not that let there. So I'm going to with uh, Viviana as well, bro. So moving on, this is this is going to be a fun fight. Brandon Moreno, Kai Kara France, Kai Kara France, who, who's had a uh, really he's only been in the UFC for just over a year, I think it is, and he's really had, gave himself like it, it was like kind of. Izzy Adesanya came into the UFC, fought a lot in his mm-hmm. first year, really put himself out there. Kai Kara Francis really did the same. Um, but I think he's got his toughest matchup now. I think he's he's got a really tough guy in Brandon Moreno. How do you how do you see this encounter going down? I think it's a hard fight. I think mm-hmm. Brandon, Brandon Moreno is a hard fight. Anyone. Anywhere. You fight that guy, he is a horrible fight. Because he's got really good scrambles. Brandon, Brandon Moreno has. So he's got really good scrambles. He's good at crap, getting... He's good with the... With the striking, initiating the striking to the grappling aspect, I think he does that really well. One thing that kind of caught me off guard with uh, Kai Con France was his last performance, really. I thought he performed really well. Yeah. In fact, if I'm honest with you, I didn't really think he was going to win. Um, and the kid, I can see why he won, because he's on like a crazy win streak at the moment, outside of the UFC as well. I think he's on like six, seven, eight win fight win streak or something. So that does huge amounts for your confidence. Um, like, like kind of like Max Holloway felt like he felt like he was untouchable. He was going to just, everything was flowing for him. And I think that's what's happened. We might see this here. I think Kai's got a, a huge amount of confidence about him. And, and his jab in his fight against Mark De La Rosa 
can't, it really impressed me because I thought he f- he popped that jab out and that really absolutely flustered and ruined De La Rosa's game. He, he De La Rosa could not get the rhythm going. He wasn't landing very good strikes. He couldn't get the takedown aspect. You know, I was surprised with Kaya's defense on the takedowns and grappling aspect. I thought once he went to the ground, he was probably going to go to sleep. And, and I think this is the, it's going to happen. Similar. I'm going to go with Kai Kara France. I'm just going to let people know now. I think Brendan is a hard fight. I do. I just got a got a feeling that Kai Kara France is just catching people out with a weird, like weirdly good skill set. I didn't think he was. I didn't think too much of him. But he's got a sniper like jab, an amount of confidence which is beaming off him, and he shows it in the cage. The confidence. He he's super com- good conditioning. As well now he like showed good conditioning for that three rounds against De La Rosa. He did not stop going. Um, he's gonna have a couple of scares in this fight, with especially the gram- uh, scramble aspect. I think there will be kind of grappling exchanges, getting to the ground and back up again. But I want to go decision for Kai Car France, man. I, I just have a weird feeling that the kid can do it. It's uh, I, I really like Kai Car France, but I'm just not completely sold on him yet. I, I'm mm. not. I think I think that. I mean. When you look at his record, his record's not flattering. Um, yeah. He had a lot of, of losses early on. I'm guessing. Um, I mean, he, he was against Falcaroli, who was a, a, a like a a guy that fought for a long time. He 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 lost a few fights kind of early on. He was like a, more or less a 500 fighter. But then he's obviously started to put it all together, and you can see where he went this fight. He's a stand-up fighter first and foremost, and he showed. Um, Really solid combination striking, uh, high high output, um, and he's got a little bit of a um, decent takedown game as well, where he can stop the takedowns more than 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 really kind of get them himself. But he did get a couple against Piver, some really quick reaction ones where he took him down. Piver popped straight back up. He was kind of getting beat up in the feet a little bit in that fight though. Um, but yeah. Piver's one of those longer longer flyweights. I think he's a really solid fighter. I thought De La Rosa was going to give him problems. I thought he would mix in takedowns. He showed some really good takedown defense there. Where I think that Marino is probably the biggest guy I want to say of the four. Uh, Piva might actually be on the same Piva kind of... was quite big. Yeah, uh, let me think. Actually, look at that. Piva came alive in the third. Yeah, he was. But so, it was too late. Yeah, he is... Yeah, he, he's like a five foot eight mm. leather, uh, flyweight and... Um, Moreno's five foot seven. I think Moreno. I mean, this is a big fight for him. I know he's coming off the split draw, which honestly he won that fight. I bet Askar Askarov, mm. uh, and I thought he was a little bit lucky to definitely get a draw. I thought that that was Moreno's fight, even though it was a great fight, a really fun film. Good fun fight, that, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of action in it. I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, there was a lot of kind of scrambles and takedowns and passes and. Um, it was just a really fun fight. I really enjoyed it. So this for me, I think if Moreno can try and mix it up, I think he has an advantage on the ground. Whether he keeps Kai Kara France there is a different story because um, he seems like he can pop straight back up and get back into the striking realm, which he's far more technical than what Moreno is. I think Moreno actually cracks pretty hard. Uh, I just see this being like really, really close. I think Moreno has to mix it up. I don't think if, if it stays a striking affair, he loses this fight because I think the output, the accuracy, um, just the varying combinations of Kai Kara France will kind of just win over the 15-minute period. But I think if Moreno can somehow get some top time um, and try and catch him with some submissions, because he is crafty down there as well, um, I think he can win this fight. So I'm going to go Brandon Moreno via split decision. I think it's going to be really, really close. But I think this is where he, he hands... Um, Kai Kara, his first loss in the UFC here, but really, really fun fight there. I'm looking forward to that one. Now, this is one that uh, I didn't really have kind of too much on until I sat back and watched a little bit, but it's Chase Hooper mm. making his UFC debut against Daniel Tamer. And I had some people hit me up saying, like, should I bet Chase Hooper? And I'm like, I haven't really watched anything, so I'm not going to say anything. Uh, I remember him from, I think it was the Dana White Contender Series or whatever it was. Mm. And, I mean, the kid's young. He's like 20 to 21 years old. I think he's 20. Uh, yeah. yeah, so he is a young, young fighter in his career. It might be a little bit too early, him being in the UFC. But he's got the record to say that he deserves to be there. The, the, the UFC think he deserves to be there. So who am I to say that he doesn't belong in the UFC just because of his age? Um, 8 0 and 1 record. The, the one draw where he had with, uh, I think it was LaShawn Alcox, he 
I, I think I probably edged it for him, but there was parts there where, when I look at him, he's very, very hittable. Mm-hmm. He moves back with his chin in there. Um, he can he can fight at length. He, like you can see him with his teeth kicks. He, he throw them up high. He can he can really, as considering he's only twenty years old, he's got. Uh, you can see he's got something there where he knows he's got length on a lot of opponents, uh, especially coming out of the southpaw stance, and that's going to cause people fits. Being in that one forty five pound division, maybe going up to one fifty five later on because, like I say, he is only a young lad still. Mm. But um, yeah, you can see he's got. Uh, he, he can fight a distance a little bit, but his striking defense is really bad. The, the one spot where he looks really good is that if he can get you in, in, in top. So if he's on top of you, that, that's when he throws a lot of elbows. He's got a lot of output down there. And um, yeah, he, he can definitely get there. He's got some really decent jujitsu as well. Uh, I think he's a black belt already from what I hear. People really talk highly of him as a black belt. But when I sat back and watched him, I was like, like the Sean Alcock's, He's got a 500 record, um, fought some decent guys, but he had a position there where, I, where he could have got the leg lock or whatever. If, I, if I'm thinking this guy's a a good BGG kind of phenomenon, whatever it is, he should be subbing guys like him. Um, he got dropped at, I think it was the end of the first round there, hit with some big shots. Um, yeah, you can see he, he could potentially turn into a good fighter. Daniel Tamer, big win last time out. He was on the chopping block fought really well. The one worry I've got is him diving in for takedowns and him being too aggressive. Um, if, I think if he was to sit back a little bit uh, and just pick his shots a little bit better, he is very kind of frenzied. He has frenzied attacks uh, and you don't really know what's coming from him. He, he's kind of go, go, go. Um, and he, I think he makes some bad decisions in fights. But um, yeah, if he dives in for takedowns here, I think he could be in a world of hurt. So I think he needs to really, if he's going to go in for takedowns, pick his chances and pick his opportunities kind of relatively um, at good times. Because if Chase Hooper gets him in top position, he could literally rain down elbows. And, and we've seen Tamer submitted a couple of times as well. And this guy's long. So if he gets mm. gets the back, he, he, that could potentially be all she wrote. I, I'm not sold on Chase Hooper yet. I'm going to go with Daniel Tamer. But I was thinking about betting Daniel Tamer. Uh, and I thought, oh, I can't do it because he makes mistakes. He's too aggressive. He might jump in after the first minute, go for a takedown and catch a guillotine and get submitted. So I'm going to sit back and watch and see how it goes. Um, plus, he, like I say, he absorbs a lot of strikes. Both guys do. So he could maybe get pinged with something. I- I'm going to pick Daniel Tamer, but in no means is it a confident pick. But I'm going to pick him to win here. Yeah, it's yeah. a five foot five against six foot one. Yeah. <sighs> That's. Yeah. Definitely somebody to take into consideration a high differential. Um, I just think it'd be more effective if Chase was very good at striking. Yeah. Uh, he's not the he's not the most effective at striking. He takes too many hits for my liking. Uh, he's 18 years old and getting hit like that. I don't like that. I'm like kid. You're punching that ticket too many times too early. By the time you're 25, there won't be a chin. There will mm. not be a chin. You will, and he's going to fight a guy, Daniel Tamer, who's going to be very smart, I hope, mm. and goes body body or aims for the body and comes over with a high like over looping, overhand left, overhand right, etc. Stepping in on strikes, um, leg kicks are there as well because Chase Hooper hasn't got really much footwork. I think Daniel Tamer is way more active on the feet with foot, footwork and angles. Uh, I'd like to see Tamer whipping leg kicks, really kind of put Chase, you know. On the um, kind of on the on the mark, really, with the leg kicks, kind of stop him moving, so he's an even easier target to try and hit. Chase, I think he's going to have to try and go for clinch work, trips, you know, because he'll have those longer legs, he'll be able to get the trips. If you Daniel Tamer, like his brother's got to say to him, please just stick to the actual game plan and stop doing what you do, where you just go off on your little merry way, thinking you know what's best in the fight, just. Shoot for, the, strike the body, go up top, hit the well, go upstairs. That's it. All he's do is just go, go, go low, go high, and he will crack chase. But the problem is, as you know yourself, well, Daniel just gets as soon as he lands one heavy shot, that's it. Then he just goes berserk mode, and I'm like, no, why don't you go to, the, why don't you st- stop doing that? Just maybe take your time and land it again. You know, set it up a bit different and land that same punch. I think Chase can get put to sleep. I do. I think, especially when you're six one, you're cutting down to one forty five. I, I, I'm not confident that's going to be good for your body. 
Do you know what I mean? I, I, he hasn't got a lot on him, don't get me wrong, but that's another fear. It's like, I know he's good at grappling, don't get me wrong, but is he that strong? Or is it just a leverage of the limbs that has given him that advantage when he's grappling? So I'm going to go Tamer as well, bro. I think Tamer should should actually put Chase to sleep. He should crack him and put him to sleep. I think he should be hitting that body, really ripping the body and the liver up and just taking it over the hand, like over, over the hand right, over hand left and putting Chase to sleep. Uh, so I'm going to go Tamer on this one. Mm. Moving on, prelims. Matt Brown makes his return after a pretty lengthy injury against Ben Saunders here. Mm. So, uh, yeah, how do you see it going? Yeah, it's a weird one. It's like a, which one's going to retire first cup fight. Um... I thought Ben would have retired by now. It's frustrating that he still hasn't retired. I'm surprised he's still getting fights in the UFC, honestly. I don't get it. I do not get it. I don't know what the point is. I'd just like, like I'd say to him, go off and do grappling competitions because he's a good grappler. You know, he's on a grappling aspect on its own. He's a very good grappler, jiu-jitsu practitioner, ten planet jiu-jitsu and all that. Um, I'm gonna go Matt Brown. I'm gonna be. A, it's a short. It's a short one in this one because um, there's not much to analyze. I think Ben is just happy to get the paycheck. And no, I've got zero confidence in his chin. Um, I've got more confidence in Matt Brown's chin. Matt Brown's got a very forward fighting kind of style. I don't think if, and he's strong. Matt Brown's really strong. Does crazy strength and conditioning. I think Ben might have a tough time trying to get to the fight. I think Matt Brown just has to maybe throw the throw the lever, keep him keep the distance, keep him at cage, get Ben against the cage, get him flustered and just land heavy on him. Um, Ben really wants to get the clinch if he can to throw knees or if he can go to the ground he'd like to get on to the ground and grapple but I'm going to go with Matt Brown I just think he can land a strike on Ben Saunders I don't have any ch- I don't have any faith in Ben Saunders' chin so mm-hmm. I've got to go Matt, uh, Mr. Matt Brown here yeah there's more toughness on the Matt Brown side um, he's willing to get out in his shield like and seeing that Ben Saunders is a guy who puts he, well, I mean his last three losses he's been yeah, stopped no choice. <laughs> yeah, so, and I mean his last five losses he's been stopped so yeah. he's back in the UFC. He's got a two and five record. So I'm really surprised they keep him around. Mm. Um, like I say, Matt Brown, he should win this fight. Yeah. But I don't have like super supreme confidence he's going to do it because you watch the fights and like he cannot take body shots mm. at all. And Ben Saunders, what he does have is he does have long levers. If he was to catch him with a with a body kick, I've no doubt about it that he could hurt Matt Brown to the body. Um, but like you said, Matt Brown. Uh, Ben Saunders can't really take a shot to the chin, so it's really who lands first. Um, it'd be interesting if we kind of get into a grappling kind of situation. Matt Brown, I think, in his last three losses, has been stopped as well, so it's not like um, he's immune to... But in saying that, he's been... Like, he has been um, knocked out by probably far superior guys than you know, Takanori Sato to Donald Cerrone. So it's... it's, it's, it's <laughs> Jake Ellenberger... Like everybody should really be beating Jake Ellenberger and he hurt Jake in that fight but couldn't capitalise on it and then he got hurt with a body kick and it folded him it shut him up big time so he is definitely susceptible to the body his uh, aggressiveness is something here that could play into him jumping at the clinch taking a knee in the gut folding down maybe getting submitted whatever um, beat Diego Sanchez in his last win over two years ago mm. I mean, I'm going to pick Matt Brown but I'll say this now, would it surprise me if Ben Saunders caught him with like a body kick or something and hurt him and stopped the fight? It would not would not surprise me in the slightest. Pick's going to be Matt Brown via, um, I've got a TKO, but like I say, if, oh, I'm not sure about that fight at all, if I'm being honest with you. I think that Ben Saunders could maybe um, mess up a lot of people's parlays. I think Matt Brown's probably going to be a parlay piece of people like, oh, that might be something decent there, but uh, not for me. Uh, I'll sit back and watch and Watch. There's going to be a finish in that fight regardless, I think. I'd be surprised if it goes to the decisions. But I've got Matt Brown there. So. Um, Ian Heinish against Amari Akhmadov. I'm struggling with this pick, if I'm being honest with you. I think this is a really has the potential to be a very close fight over the 15-minute period. You watch Heinish. He, he might do kind of well with people like this who are kind of wrestle boxers because um, that's what kind of Akhmadov is. He really boxes to try and get his wrestling, but he's quite happy actually sitting there and... Um, kind of trading some leather a little bit which um, I actually think he's filled out really well for 185 I think at 170 he was like mm. a lost soul uh, moved up there 
had a couple of really good wins over Tim Boach, Zach Cummins, where he's outstruck them, and when he's needed to, he's taken them down. Uh, and that's pretty much what people have tried to do with Ian Heinish. They've tried to take him down, and he's been so dogged about getting back to his feet. And then once he gets back to his feet, he, he really hurts guys with his striking. But in saying that, you look at the Ferreira fight, couldn't really take a shot, um, and kind of hurt him with, with, with some of the strikes on the feet, even though he did get taken down multiple times. Carlos Jr. did the exact same. And they're two really dangerous jiu-jitsu guys, but he, he still managed to find a way to... like He had his back taken in some instances and that, and, and managed to get out of situations like that. Um, then the Brunson fight, he was kind of exposed where Brunson's kind of funky striking, length, speed, just awkwardness, really played against him, and Brunson also got takedowns. I think Atmadov will probably stand and trade a little bit more with Heinish. But I think he will try and mix in takedowns. Atmadov really doesn't have anything technical. He throws big wing and punches. Um, but he's tough. The guy can take a shot as well. So I, I'm having a, a kind of tough time picking this fight, if I'm being honest with you. I've been kind of sliding back and forth. But um, it might be one of these fights that kind of goes to decision, could be relatively close, could go to either guy. I see it as a bit of a close uh, pick and fight. But I am going to lean Ian Heinish very, very closely. So I've got Ian Heinish for a split decision now. Yeah, I'm going decision on this fight. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be like a slugfest by the second, latter part of the second, third round. Um, especially um, Akhmedov, he he gasses because of his fighting style. Where, like you said, he swings. That is it. If you look at his fights, he he gets to like the third round and he's having to like it's like watching an energy bar on a computer character. You have to get the energy bar full to throw a couple of big heavy, heavy swingers. The energy bar empties, and you watch him just like plod, plod, energy, energy up, 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 up. Okay, I'll have a go now. Uh, and it's his conditioning. You know, he's his style. He, he's doing a lot of work with ATT. Um, Daru Strong. He's doing a lot of conditioning work with them. But as, as no matter how hard he works at that, if your technique is poor, it doesn't. It really cancels out your conditioning le- condition levels. Because if you're throwing, missing shots, and you're using Ex- excessive energy when you're striking when you don't need to it's it doesn't matter how much condition you do because it's always going to weigh you down and I, I find that with him he does he does taper off big time from second round onwards you start to see the numbers go down you start to see the energy go down a bit um, Ian Heinish he has got good condition that's the only kind of that, between the two of them I think Heinish has got a good three rounds in him he can, he can, he's got a good energy level about him he's got good output Um if I'm Heinish in this fight, my game plan is getting Akhmedov against the cage and just grapple with him for the first round. It'll just be make it a dirty first round. You know, Heinish is a bit... He's like a puppy. Heinish, you know, when you get when you, when you see a puppy and it runs around super excited and he's dead, go, 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 go in the fight. In the Brunson fight, Brunson was like, I'm going to be the patient one. I'm going to let you come at me, all hell bells, and I'm just going to take my time. And, it, and that was a, it was weird. It was like Brunson must have been looking at the style that he used to be doing where it was just going gun ho and going crazy. It was like, yeah, do the style that works. Be patient. Pick your shots. Take your time with it. I wish Heinish maybe do it in this fight, but we don't know. Hopefully he's learned from the Brunson fight. Maybe he will come out of a different attitude. I'm going Brun- um, so Heinish in this fight. I think that his lesson would be learned from the Brunson fight. It was a great lesson for him in that fight. A really good marker for him as well to let him know that he's not far off. He's not far off that up, that that level, that that kind of you know top high level of the the middleweight. He's not that bad, and he's not that far off. And I think Agmedov is a good marker for him to just get that game plan in, practice those kind of alterations on his style, and just implement it. And I think he'll get the decision win. I think condition, the conditioning he has, and especially in the later parts of the second and third round, will play factor in him. And I think he can get away. Uh, get away. Sorry, I think he can walk away with the win. Yeah. Um, up next, we've got the return of Caitlin Vera, who's a kind of forgotten name, really, um, in the women's bantamweight division, but she's undefeated. If she comes back in here, makes a, another strong case for herself, she's probably going to get a title shot very, very soon. Um, against Irene Aldana, a really fun fight. Um, who have you got there? Yeah, it's been out for 20 months. Mm-hmm. It's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. It's a long time. Uh, beat uh, Kat Zingano last time out. Uh, and to be honest with you, Cassin Garno just did not have an answer for her. No. She looked out of sorts. And you you know, Will, if you look back, we we know from watching Cassin Garno fights, it, it, she, 
if she doesn't feel like she can get it, the win, she fights in a way that's aggressive and she makes it dirty. She makes that, yeah. And she didn't. She she looked just lost. She just looked lost. She looked like she, she it was almost like she said, even if I try to make it dirty, I don't think it's going to stop this girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to credit to Ketlin's performance, her team, everyone, she looked, she looked really, really superb in that fight. Um, but in the time that Ketlin's gone, Aran Aldana, she has come back to herself. Her form that we knew about with the strike and the one-twos, the jabs, the boxing, the footwork. She's really come back into it and she's looked a lot better. Like if you picked, if this fight had been matched up 18 months ago, I would have picked Ketlin all day long. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even give Aldana an ounce of chance with it because I thought she, she's just not going to get the, she's not going to get close to it. But if you look at Let's have a look here. One, two, three. So since then, Aldana's went three and one in the last uh, four fights since Ketlin's fought. Split decision loss to Raquel Pennington was the only lost. So you can see already there's this huge improvements on her. Um, but what you've got to remember is we don't know what Ketlin's been doing in the background. We don't know what she's been adding to her skill set. We don't know. She can come out a different fighter stylistically in that time and I'm going to go with Ketlin Vieira because I think she's got more weapons in the fight I think she's got more tricks to apply to the fight I think if Irene Aldana can keep you on the end of a jab she wins fights but the issue is Ketlin's not the kind of girl who'll just follow you into her into the jab that's the problem she had with like Betch, Betch Correra Irene Aldana beat Betch is absolute dog poo Right at boxing, and she just walked into a jab and straight, thinking, "Oh, once you've thrown yours, I'll throw mine." No, Aldana threw a one-two and then got the fuck out of dodge, and you were punching for air. I don't think Ketlin's going to do that. I think Ketlin's going to be able to maneuver out the way of the jabs to to the extent, hit leg kicks, also get the grappling aspect in on the clinch work, and I think she can get the decision win here. It'll be a hard fight for her, but it's what Ketlin needs is someone like this, Aldana, who's going to be running on her back foot. You know, just close her off. If you close out Darner off, she really starts to have a bit of a problem in uh, that kind of close co- that close quarter situation. So I'm going to go with Ketlin here. Not an easy one to pick. I think Aldana is super live because she could just jab this fight for three rounds and run on the back foot. But I'm going to go with Ketlin here. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's takedowns are going to be where this fight's won and lost because yeah. if Portland can get takedowns, she's going to. I think she's going to. That's where she's going to go. Majority of the time, she's going to. Because I do think that Ketlin Vera will get outboxed on the feet because I think Aldana has some really good boxing. Mm. I mean, I know her last opponent was kind of like a, a kind of just there to be hit, really. <laughs> yeah. get hit. She was just like a punching bag. Yeah. Um, and Aldana, I mean, she uses her length really well. She mixes her strikes up really well. Great jab. Um, she can also get hit quite a bit as well. So she's willing, she's not scared at taking a shot as... Uh, Aldana to, to kind of give one or two off and she, she's a fight I actually really like watching Aldana fight I think she's a really fun fight I've always thought that she's gave us fun fights the UFC I mean the Pudalova fight was fun I really enjoyed the Melo fight just how superior she was with her strike in there um, and I thought she was a little bit unlucky against Raquel Pennington but I did think it was kind of the right decision there if I'm being honest um, but like I say takedowns I think is where this fight's going to be won and lost because Caitlin Vera, she does take a lot of strikes. She, her striking defense is not all that great. I think she she gives you opportunity to hit her, but she's very strong at getting her takedowns. And once she gets her takedowns, she's ready. To, she's really good on the ground as well. She will pass guard multiple times. If you're quite active off your back, she will move to different positions. Um, Aldana's definitely not as live on, on the floor as what Zangano was. Zangano's always moving, looking for ways to get out back to her feet and so on. Aldana will probably settle for being on her back for too long and lose large parts of the rounds through that. But that's really what you look at. She, you, you watch the majority of her fights, and she gets hit a lot, but she gets her takedowns. And once she gets her takedowns, she's very strong on top. Um, she, she's got takedowns in every fight that she's had in the UFC. And, I mean, she's got um, that, that finish over Sarah McMahon, who Sarah McMahon's really known for, for, for kind of quitting on herself once it gets tough. Caitlin Vera made it tough, got her out of there. And then the Zingano fight. That's a tough fight to take because Zingano's just a bit of a wild woman. You never know what you're going to get with her. She's hard to... Um, she can take you down, but she, um, 
she can get you down as well. And she 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 tried, but Vera I think was very kind of strong with her takedown yeah. defense as well. And um, yeah, so I'm going to go Kaitlyn Vera as well. Like initially, I thought, am I going to pick Aldana here? Because um, I, I I thought she can come out here, and maybe box her up, but I just don't think she's going to stop enough takedowns to win the fight. Now I can maybe see Aldana making this really close when it goes to the decision, and it could look relatively close. So. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Aldana actually comes out here and maybe gets a decision herself. I'm going to edge a, a close, close 29-28 decision for Caitlin Vera. And, uh, yeah, like I say, if she, she wins impressively here, you'd think that she might be next in line for Amanda Nunes because, uh, I mean, her record states that she's probably um, ready for a, a bit a big step up. But coming off 18 months uh, off, it's, it's a long stretch to... To get back into the twenty months, did you say it was? Um, yeah, about twenty months ago. Yeah, I think it was like March twenty eighteen. Yeah. Last time fight. Well, going from an Aldana to a Nunes is so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Caitlin Vera, I've got for the win here, but I I can see it being relatively close there. So, I'm mm. uh, moving on to the main fight, of the prelims. This is a banger. This is a great fight. Um, <laughs> Jeff Neal, Mike Perry, really, you know, yeah, hands together kind of fight. Yeah. You'd be surprised if you got fighters coming in here looking for takedowns. Um, both guys predominantly like to stand and bang. Um, and uh, if you look at kind of both guys, that's really kind of what they do is they stand, stand and throw heavy, heavy heat in kind of different ways. Um, but Jeff Neal can mix up. You've seen that in the, the Nico Price mm-hmm. fight. He yes. got a couple of takedowns when because Nico Price is not similar to Mike Perry, but he's super aggressive. And give you opportunities to take him down, to hit him. We just don't want to get hit by Nico Price because he can kind of hit you with odd things and hurt you. And he, he did that. He hurt. He hit Jeff Neal mm. with a few big shots that kind of rattled him a little bit. But ultimately, the kind of technique um, and the kind of endurance of Jeff Neal really played off. What I like about Jeff Neal is when this is his first full camp, being a full time fighter. No other distractions, no other way to go out and make his money. He has been dialed in 100%, I think, on this camp. Um, and that's got to, that's only got to help him, especially with the camp that he's at. Um, and you look at his wins. I think outside of his first first win against Kamozi, Kamozi's not really UFC caliber. Camacho tough. He absolutely took a licking in that fight before getting head kicked. Bilal Muhammad is as solid a fighter we're going to find at 170. It's never easy against that guy. Um, not unless your name's for Sandy Luke and you knock him out early, but he Bilal Muhammad will will give you a a 15 minute affair where he's never out of the fight, he's always there but at the end of it, Jeff Neal was just too good and mm-hmm. then Equal Price one like I mentioned he, he, that's a, I don't think he looked great in that fight, came through I think he's got a, a number beside his name I think he's number 15 now in that division so now he's defending his kind of position against Mike Perry who, I mean Mike Perry if you don't like watching Mike Perry fight, there's something wrong, he, he's so up and down, like he'll He's going to be one of those fighters that is always, I think, going to be around the UFC. He will take many losses, but he'll have many wins. He'll have many highlights on his his highlight reel because he's so uh, fun to watch. He really is. He's a fun, fun fighter. Um, actually, has he got a, a losing record in the UFC? Six, one, two, three, four, five. So six and five record. Uh, Ooh, close. That, that, that's kind of close. And like Even the Danny Roberts fight, that was... He took some licks in that one. That was a great fight to watch, by the way. Um, Pure violent, that one. Yeah, I was watching that live. And that was yeah, it was. It. There was a lot of um, leather landing in that fight. There was a lot mm. of staggering about. But um, if you could fight a game plan against Mike Perry, um, you win fights. And you, you can do it easily. Max Griffin did it. Alan Joban did it. Um, I mean, he's faced some top guys, your Cerrone, your Ponzinibbio's. He's going to be a guy that's always going to hover around top 15, but never, ever be top 15. Jeff Neal, in my opinion, is a top 10 UFC welterweight and will be for a few years at least. And I think he's got the more progression. I don't think you're ever going to see Mike Perry make massive leaps in his game. I mean, he went to Jackson's to try and go to that bigger camp and it, it's just not in him. I don't think he's got the learning facilities to kind of really push himself to be a top 15, top 10 guy, but he's always going to hover around that top 20 to top 15. He's going to get matched up with those guys as well. But you know what you're going to get with Mike Perry. He's going to be blood and guts in your face. He's going to he's going to want to come out and just take your chin off no matter what you're throwing back at him. Jeff Neal is just too technical. I think he can throw, um, he can come up top, catch him with high kicks. I think he could take him down if he wanted to. But Perry's got a, a, like a, a chin of steel. 
can take some serious damage. If you go back um, 2016 when he came to the UFC, I said that guy is going to get knocked out in the UFC with the way he fights because you've seen in the regionals he took too many shots uh, to get dropped. Really hasn't came. It's kind of interesting that he's come to the UFC and not really taking like canvas snaps like mm-hmm. I thought he would. I thought he would, but especially the division and some of the guys that he's faced. Um, I just think Jeff Neal's too good. I think Jeff Neal, he's in his spot here. This is going to be the coming out party where if both guys come out here and start trading, he might get him. He might get that uh, signature knockout of of Mike Perry. Um, I think it, I, I, I don't think he is. So I think he's going to kind of beat him up over 15 minutes. So I've got Jeff Neal via decision. Nice. nice. Yeah, I think uh, Mike Perry is frustrating as well because he has got good hands when he uses them. He could use his jab a lot better. He could use. Uh, he's very heavy on the front leg. Very bo- You know that boxing kind of style. It's, I feel it's rough to call him a pro. Uh, I only had one pro boxing bout which he lost. He got stopped. So it's hard to go. Ah, oh, former pro boxer. In theory, he was. Yeah, technically, but. Not enough around, but he is very boxing orientated with his strike, with his on his foot, uh, heavy on the front foot. But I don't think he used the jab enough. I don't think he's light enough on his feet, in my opinion. I think he'd do a lot more footwork, and he could be a lot more effective. I think he'd land those heavier shots a lot better. Um, he's similar to like John Phillips in that way, where you see John Phillips in the middleweight division. You see there's limitations with John Phillips and limitations in his style. I think Mike Perry's the same. I think that he could do more. But he's going to fight a guy in Jeff Neal who already has the weapons already that Mike should have had by now or should be looking to get to add to his game. I think Mike Perry's going to be coming aggressive. I think it's when you'll be surprised when Jeff Neal will get the takedowns and when he landed that ground and pound on Nico Price. <gasps> From God and Hulk smash his face. Oh my word, stiffened him. Oh man, that was crazy. Like, knocked him out of the, and then woke him up with it. It was mental. But, I think Jeff Neal is a dangerous man. So he's got a lovely all round set. And like, I think that great one, the, the great fight was the Billy Old Muhammad fight. It was a perfect fight because he, he got to do, he got to test himself really hard there because, like you said, Will, Benil will give you a hard 15 minutes. And that's what Jeff needed. He Jeff needed a hard fight like that, really to kind of give himself an idea of what he can do in 15 minutes, how much of an output he can do, what his condition is, what his skill set is, and how he handles someone like that. And I thought he, I thought he looked superb. Um, in, in part of that fight and I think with this fight he should probably outclass Mike Perry I think everyone sitting there thinking it's going to be a stand and bang rock and sock him I think Jeff Neal's going to land on Mike Perry then Mike Perry's going to come aggressive Jeff Neal gets the takedowns when he comes too close and, and just wins it that way kind of like, almost like a rinse and repeat kind of style with that technique and method and I, I don't see anything wrong with that I think that uh, Jeff could sh- Jeff's got the head kicks as well you know, let's not take that out of context. Let's not forget Jeff can throw those kicks. So I'm going to go with Jeff Neal um, for like a third round stoppage or decision win. Okay, so moving on to the main uh, the main card here. We're starting off in the bantamweight. First two fights. First three fights, actually. Uh, first two fights and then the women's bantamweight, I should say. Mm. So, uh, two guys I love. Uh, I'm a massive Uriah Faber fan. I have been for years. I remember I used to go kind of crazy... Um, for his clothing back in the day, yeah, uh, the Talk. form athletics, yeah, form torque and form athletics that he did with mm. John Jones did all that. I loved that. It was some of my most favorite MMA gear. I've been a massive Faber Mark for years. I really have. I think he's um, a legend. He's, he's one of those mm. legendary guys. They might never have the the UFC belt, but a legend of the lower weight classes. He really is. Yeah. And he's against one of the guys I completely adore in 2019 coming out of 2020 and Peter Yan and if you've been a fan of the, the huddle here and, and been around me and John and especially me listening talking about Peter Yan you know what my thoughts on this guy are so um, yeah John I'll let you lead off because I think people pretty much know where I'm going in this one so uh, I'm, I'm going to say out right now that I love both fighters and uh, I was uber surprised in Faber's performance against Simone I think when I watched it back, I thought maybe Ricky Simone was, sounds daft, but starstruck, let's say. It just seemed like Ricky Simone was a little bit taken back that he's fighting Ryan Faber, because obviously Ryan Faber had retired. And, in, well, as he had. He'd stepped away for a while, he'd been gone a while. And 
I think he was probably just never thought that would happen. He'd get to fight someone like that, who was probably an inspiration to him. I think Uriah Faber's an inspiration to all the guys, even Peter Yan, if I'm honest with you. I think he'd be, he'd, he even say he's, a, he's an inspiration to him from the he's a smaller weight class guy, he's been around for years. Uriah Faber looked sharp, looked good in that fight, but it was only brief. We don't know how good a 40 year old Uriah Faber looks in the second round, third round. No one has a clue. And I'm not saying he's going to look awful, because he's always going to be a good fighter, but age does take a toll on you, especially when he's been fighting for so many years. It's got to have a toll on the body. You can't say you're going to have that quick reactions all the time, or you're going to have that great condition. It's got to have a toll. Um, so we don't. I can't take a lot from the Ricky Simone fight. All I can take from it is Rick, Peter Yan needs to mind his P's and goddamn Q's and move his goddamn head a little bit more, and that's it. Peter Yan, very compact fighter when he comes, but he just plods forward. You know, he's just nice and patient coming forward. He's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a chance to hit you." And when I do, I'm not gonna throw a one punch. I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw like a one-two left hook. I'm gonna whip a leg kick in as well. Why not? Or a body kick. Or I'm gonna throw a head. He, he's beautiful in that sense. He doesn't throw one shot. He throws a bunches, and he finds some great shots in there. But because he pushes forward, he doesn't go forward as in he ch he's great because I think Uriah Faber will have the difficulty here where Yan doesn't close you down quick where you get the takedown in. Where, do you know when you get there's that range between where you can punch and the range where you're so close is more of a grappling opportunity. Yan's really good at keeping that separate. He's really good at just slowly coming to the ward you to get in shot, to get in striking range without that risk of coming forward too quick to get taken down and that's where Uriah Faber might have to try and use a bit of uh, creativity to get that takedown up uh, and into Peter Yan maybe closing down against the cage and do it off the cage possibly but I think Peter Yan the problem Uriah Faber's got is going to have a guy who's going to come forward who's going to throw combinations not one shot combinations, but he doesn't stop coming forward. With Jan, it's very rare he stop, he comes back. And sh you know, he got he got. I think in the Jimmy Rivera fight, I think once or twice he didn't come forward because he took a couple of he got hit. I think, and I'm not saying he was rocked, but he got he got his, his bell rung, and I think he just took a step back to go reset. Let's go. Uh, and in the in the Jimmy Rivera fight, he looked solid. He looked, he looked really really good performance. And I think he's going to show it here against Uriah Faber. I think he's going to have... The output is going to be greater than Uriah Faber's over the three rounds. And I think it, he'll just break down Uriah Faber over the three rounds. It'll just be a hard, hard... Because because Jan's not going to go for the takedown. Because Faber's got a very good guillotine attempt uh, from the takedown uh, takedowns. I'm going to go with Peter Jan. Decision win. I think he'll just be able to put a relentlessness on him. He's over at... Uh, What's it called? Uh, AKA Thailand, I think it is, yeah. Um, Tiger Muay Thai. Tiger Muay Thai, sorry, that's the one. I knew it was someone in Thailand. The Tiger Muay Thai is out there again, drilling. Drillers make killers. And I'm sure they'll have a lot of guys around with a Uriah Faber esque style to just keep drilling on them. So I'm going to go that way with Peter Yan, mate. I've got to, I've got to pick him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't pick against Peter Yan here. Uh, I think this is. Kind of shrewd matchmaking on the side of the kind of Peter Peter Yan side of getting that. Uh, no matter if Uriah Faber's not in his prime or uh, he, who knows, he might be in his prime. Uh, getting a win over Uriah Faber is going to open some eyeballs and get some more eyes on people because people follow Uriah Faber and they, they have done for years. And so all those eyeballs now transfer over to Peter Yan. I just think this is like Uriah, I don't think he's going to throw as much. Um, Peter Yan's going to stalk him, he's going to kick legs out from him. I think that Faber's always been susceptible to taking leg kicks. That showing that's never really changed. Mm -hmm. But don't underestimate Peter uh, Uriah Faber and mm -hmm. take uh, maybe maybe catching him, Peter Young with a shot and maybe briefly putting him down and maybe getting into a scramble on the ground. I think that's Faber, going to be Faber's way to try and win the fight if he can somehow land a shot and maybe get into scrambling positions where he can maybe catch him with something. Outside of that, I think Peter Young could break him down systematically over the 15 minutes. Um, I don't think he stops Faber because Faber is tough. He's a hard guy to get out of there, no matter if he's in his prime or not in his prime. He's just a tough guy to get out of there and, and can take a lot of damage. Uh, and Peter Jans, I think, is going to be fighting for a title in 2020. Um, I really do. I think that he's got the, the kind of game that's going to give a lot of fighters a lot of problems. He's very well-rounded. He's so aggressive. 
you, you actually watch some of the Tiger um, Tiger Muay Thai sparring videos. Yeah. This, this guy, like, he doesn't do light sparring sessions. Put it that way. So if you're sparring this this dude, you, you're, you're going to get some work in. Um, yeah, I've got Peter Yan. I think over 15 minutes, he, he really just puts a, a pace on Faber that Faber can't really stick with at this time in his fighting career. But, uh, yeah, I, I struggle to see the outcome of Faber getting his hand raised here, but I thought that in the Simone fight. But when you watch Simone from the weekend there, you can see that he eats a lot of shots. If you catch him with the right shot, you can put him down, and that's kind of what happened. Uh, I've got Peter Yan here for uh, I think it could be 30-26, honestly. So uh, Peter Yan for the for the dub there. Uh, going from one MMA legend and moving on to another MMA legend who's making his first attempt at moving down to a new weight division. Uh, we've got Marlon Moraes here, the, the number one contender, the former number one contender who fought for the belt last time out. Um, looking to solidify his spot at 135 against the great Josie Aldo, who, like I say, is trying to make, trying, is it a big word here, to, to make his uh, first attempt down to 135. That's been, if you've been on social media, there's a lot of stuff regarding the way Aldo's looking, and supposedly it's the first time he's dieting. Uh, and he's been a fighter for as long, so why has he not been dieting with like going to 145? Because the guy's had struggles making 145. There's been fights where he's had mm-hmm. to depress things because he had to make weight and he's looked terrible. Now he's dropping 10 pounds lighter facing the number one guy um, being 33 years old. I, I don't think he's in the prime of his career. I think that has passed. We've seen that. His durability has started to wane. Still super dangerous. You cannot mm-hmm. write him off because... No. You do that at your peril, like you did it in the Jeremy Stevens fight, and he comes out there and wrecks the body of Jeremy Stevens, stops a, a young contender in Moicano, um, but then you've seen he can't really hang with the elite of the elite of 145. Now he's moving down to 135 to face the elite of the elite because Marais is the elite, the Cejudo, and then, in my opinion, that's him. So um, the big thing, obviously, and it's going to be talked about this week, is the weight cut. I don't think he makes weight. I don't think he gets close to making weight. I think he'd be lucky if he gets past 140. I think if he gets below 140, I, I don't think that's a, a bad thing for him. I, I just don't see him making 136. I just don't see it. It's such... I don't know who's managing Josie Aldo. I just think it's bad uh, representation of that guy for, for yeah, you know, yeah, let's go down to 135. I don't see it being a fruitful... Uh, jaunt down to 135 I think even if he does make the weight he's going to be so depleted that his chin's there to be got at I think Marais does crack hard he's I think as a, a more well rounded fighter in kind of all the aspects he's very dangerous like I say you can never disrespect someone like Aldo or, or like say oh this is definitely going to be a win for Marais because Aldo can turn up and when when the chips are down and people have kind of say look this guy's not around anymore like you look at UFC 200 a lot of people are saying he's done after McGregor stopped him and he came back and absolutely whooped Frankie Edgar it wasn't even close was it insane it, that was that was a really actually like, good performance I enjoyed it but then he, he fought blessed Holloway Max Holloway and he had spots in the, in the not the first fight the second fight he really I thought he made a few adjustments but one's Max started to adjust to his style. He couldn't take the shots. His durability and his conditioning just disappeared, and, and Max Holloway him alive. Uh, and it was the same with Volkanovski. Volkanovski is just too too good right now for for Aldo. I've got Marlon Moraes. I think he stops him. So um, Marlon Moraes be a knockout in the first two rounds for me. Yeah, I agree with you. Will you can't write Josie Aldo off? No, you can't. Yeah, but but I'm going to only because he's going down a bantamweight. Uh, if you ever watch The Pianoist, he looks like Christian Bale from The Pianoist. Uh, even now, before he's even started making weight, to he's looking like apparently he said it was one forty-five or no, was it? He said it was like one forty-seven or something in the pictures or whatever. Or he looks terrible. Uh, he looks like he's got what Freddie. He looked like Freddie Mercury in his last few days. Do you know what I mean? He looks terrible. Um, so how how someone tells me he's going to perform at that top level? When he's so depleted, and that's not the way he's looking now is not always he's going to look like on Friday. Um, 
that's the only that's the only person I'm going to be. I, I'll probably sneak off in work uh, to be. Oh no, I'm off on Friday. Get in. I'm off work on Friday. I'm probably going to watch the, the Wayne's live. Get in there, buzzing. Um, so I, want, I just want to watch Aldo way in because I don't think I'm with you, Will. I don't think he makes one thirty-six. And even if he did, even if he did, he's got to make one thirty-five for a, t- a shot at the title, though. So let's say he makes one thirty-six, beats Morais. He's got to make one thirty-five. That's an extra pound. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a huge amount of weight in in percentage to body weights, and and that's at one thirty-five. I just, I, I'm not taking away his skill set. His skill set is what it is. He's got a wicked skill set. Lovely body shots. Lovely leg kicks, which he's really, really toned down on in the past few fights, which is perplexing to me because his his one of his main arsenals was his leg kicks. He's really knocked that on the head a little bit more. Favoured his more boxing style. But great takedown defence that he has as well. Don't forget that. But he's going against a guy who's a killer in Marais. And I just think Marais is going to absolutely tear him up. I think if it gets to... If, if the fight actually gets on to Saturday, I just can't see Marais losing that fight. I think he's... Aldo's going to be too depleted, too drained upstairs in the brain from the fluids and I think Marais is going to have a field day just ripping him apart I think if I'm Marais I'm, I'm, I know Aldo fades at 145 so Aldo fades after the first round like he's doing if you keep the pressure on him like Max Holloway did just pressure pressure output so if I'm Marais if I do that at 135 when that guy's depleted do the same again he's going to kill him and I think Marais is going to finish him in the first if it gets to the fight day, that is, I don't know if it's going to get to the, to make it to the cage. I really don't. I'll be I'll be shocked if he makes weight. If Aldo makes weight, I'll be shocked. I'll be, if it doesn't make weight, depending on what he weighs in at, Marais doesn't have to accept the fight. You know, and it, it, might, it might even be a point where he doesn't make a weight close enough to weight where Marais says, I'm not fighting you. Or they just call a fight off because there's nowhere close to weight. So I'm going with uh, Marais if it goes to the cage anyway. Just first round, he's going to kill him. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, like I say. Hopefully, he does make the weight. Hopefully, he he, he looks good in doing so. But everything before that, it doesn't really look like he's going to do it. But uh, yeah, it's a shame because I you hate seeing guys at thirty three, thirty four making weight cuts down. It never really ends well. Like I know TJ went and did it and got smacked down at one twenty five, and he was taking stuff. So yeah, uh, I think that. Well, Aldo signed the new contract, didn't he, with the UFC? And I think, oh, yeah. that I think with that deal in the UFC, there must have been part of it of the conversation where they said, "Look, you can't beat the champ at 145. You tried twice. What are you going to do? What are you going to do for? Why, why should we offer you a new contract?" Yeah. When he talked about going to boxing, and he probably must have said, "I'll go down a bantamweight." Mm-hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. I think I reckon Dana p- pissed his pants when he said that. But after he's finished laughing, he went, really? He went, yeah, I'll go down 135. You give me a new contract, I'll fight down at 135 from now on. And I won't give you, I won't try to go for featherweight again. Yeah. But if you see this, if he comes out here and somehow he makes a weight and he yeah. beats Marlon Marais and he does it spectacularly, he's next to... Him yeah, you can give him Suhudo. Yeah. Well, it might be smart in his play. Maybe he's feeling something. Maybe maybe he just, that, that's the, this, the way he's going to get a UFC belt uh, around his waist again. So if he beats Marlon in a spectacular way here, then... I think Sahuro would win that fight. Sahuro would absolutely win that fight. You're, you're fighting a guy like Aldo. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You want a fight like that. Yeah, great um, takedown guy against a guy who's got a great takedown defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a, that'd be a fun fight and the primes if that that was ever took place. But uh, moving on to one of our first three title fights, We've got a rematch of five six years ago. Yeah, Amanda Nunes defends one of our two belts here, the bantamweight champion and obviously the featherweight champion against the first ever UFC. Fair campaign and Jermaine Durandamy. Uh, this didn't end so well the first time for Durandamy. Mm. Do you think anything is different in this fight against Amanda Nunes, who's now as peak and as hard a fighter and as well rounded maybe a, a fighter as there is in the UFC? Uh, do you see Jermaine having a, an opportunity to to get one of those belts? Of well, if you look, if you look at Amanda Nunes six years ago. And you look at Jermaine Durandamay six years ago when they fought. You look at the difference now. I haven't seen an evolution of Jermaine Durandamay. She's kept the same skill set, done the same thing. She's just a very good striker. Amanda Nunes prior was more of a grappler. She, I think she was a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and that was her. That was a thing. She didn't have the polished striking, well, more polished striking that she has nowadays. 
Her leg kicks are better as well. She's got a she's got a lovely man. The has got lovely outside and inside leg sweeps. Like she's very good trips, very good trips. Um, you know, Amanda has come on leaps and bounds compared to Jermaine Durande. Um, of course, Jermaine Durande questionably beat Holly Holm for the belt, which it was, you know, and then she was too scared to face Cyborg. Rumour was she was too scared to fight Cyborg. Well, she must have been because she never agreed to fight her. Let's put it that way. Dana said, I want you to fight her, and she never said yes, so... Yeah, you were scared of Cyborg. There's no way he's too raised about it, which is weird, because you've fought a man in the past. And she, if she, she actually did in kickboxing, for any folks who didn't know this, during Amanda. And she won and stopped the guy. Um, but then again, when you watch Amanda Nunes, what she did to Cyborg, you're thinking, fuck that, I, to- I turned down Cyborg, and now I've got to fight Nuclear Nunes. I just don't see it going any other way. I just can't see Nunes losing to Jermaine Durand. I think if I'm Nunes, yeah, don't get me wrong, I throw missiles in my hands. But all I want to do, throw those hands, get close, take her down like last time, and, and just beat her on the ground. I don't think Jermaine Durandame can handle Amanda Nunes on the ground. When Amanda gets on top, the girl's heavy, she throws horrible, nasty ground a pound. I'd just do the same again to her. I'd be like, simple. Yeah, because I think Jermaine is going to think that Amanda's fallen in love with her hands. And I'd be like, nah, I'm just going to get you down to the ground, love, and just dominate you on the ground with jiu-jitsu and, and pa- ground a pound. So I'm going stoppage. Second round, max for Amanda Nunes. I'm that confident in Amanda Nunes in this fight. I think she's, like you say, Will Pekin. She is riding the cusp of being easily one of the best all-rounded, all well-rounded fighters in the, in the fight game. She's got everything you need to be a, to be a champ and uh, to keep hold of that belt, really. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is with this fight. I've, I've got a feeling that the random I don't know. I've just had a feeling that she might sh- like really push Amanda Nunes here. And when you look at it, she really shouldn't because, like I say, it's a one-dimensional fighter against a multifaceted fighter in Amanda Nunes who can fight you anywhere in the fight and be pretty much dominant over the other. Um, Durand Mate as a pure striker is a beautiful pure striker. She really is. And if you give her a striking matchup, a striker v. striker matchup like Holly Holm, that was close enough, but... Um, she she will show what she's got there. Really good, long accurate striking, decent combinations, uh, and just mix it up. It's just a really good striker. But mm. Amanda Nunes from 2014 to 2019 is a completely different beast. Mm-hmm. Completely different beast. She's so well-rounded, it's not even funny. Um, and the one thing that I always had against her was her cardio. Yeah. In, in the Shevchenko fights, she showed me that she could go 25 minutes with uh, a really good, solid, well-rounded fighter. And Shevchenko is that. She's very, very good. Uh, and then since then, she absolutely destroyed Raquel Pennington. Absolutely mauled Cyborg to death inside a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, moving up to 145. And then, like, just knocked the head off. Holly home with a head kick. Um, she's beat the who's who. Mm-hmm. Of, well, she's beat the random who was a former champion. She beats her again now. She's beat, pretty much beat the entire list of UFC champions, your Rousey, your Tates, mm. your Shevchenko, uh, Cyborg. Yeah, all, everyone who's held a belt. Everyone who's pretty much held a belt, she, she's got a win over and she could do it again over Durandami. I want to say Durandami's actually got a chance in this. I don't know what it is, but it's hard to really be confident going against the man of Nunes, but her having these two belts and flip-flopping between divisions, you're like, surely something's got to give us her talking about wanting take time away from the sport and start a family and so on but when she's in fight mode she looks an absolute killer um, and if you watch the first fight between these two Amanda Nunes just gets the top position and it's just raining like strikes down and Durant me to her credit she's blocking them but the ref saves her because that wasn't going to stop that was going to keep continuing to go mm. for the majority of the fight until it took her arm would have broke yeah, she would have broke had, her arm yeah, punching it nothing off her back no. if Nunes gets into this spot here I don't see where Durandam is going to make any huge, huge jumps in um, her game to really stop Amanda Nunes not stopping her or submit her. I'm going to pick Amanda Nunes. I don't know. I've got this funny feeling with this fight. I don't know what it is. I've had it in my gut for a little bit. But when you look at it, it's really it's hard to pick against Amanda Nunes. It really is. So I'm going to pick Amanda Nunes in the first. It might be a little bit close. It might go a little bit longer than the first fight, but could ultimately could be the same kind of fate. 
Uh, but I've got Amanda Nunes in the first three rounds, um, probably via uh, TKO. I think I think once she gets her down, she starts raining punches. I don't think uh, Jermaine will have anything to really get back to her feet and uh, really uh, win the fight through that. So I've got Amanda Nunes, the TKO, though. Moving on, cool main event, a cool, cool main event, I should say. We've got blessed Max Holloway against Alexander Volkanovsky for the UFC featherweight title. Um, this is a really good fight. A really good fight. I, I put a tweet earlier on. Yeah, we've got Colby and we've got Usman up there. But honestly, my eyes are all in on this fight. I mm-hmm. think it's a great fight against the featherweight goal, in my my opinion. And you've got someone in Volkanovsky who um, has really emerged in the last couple of years and um, really a good fighter, taking out some big names. Mm. Maybe not in the prime of their career, but still taking out your Mendes, your Aldos. You go back five, six years ago, those were the two guys in this division. He took them out. He, um, he stopped Mendes. He dominated Aldo in Brazil. Dominated Darren Elkins, dominated Jeremy Kennedy, Shane Young, Haruta, whoever it is he's fought in the UFC, he's dominated. He's not looked out of place. He's lost very little exchanges in um, any kind of any of the fights. He's very. He's not many. I don't even think he's lost rounds. So he's been completely dominant, and now he's moving on from Aldo, who will forever go down as one of the best featherweight champions, one of the best champions in the sport, to Max Holloway, who has honestly transformed himself into an incredible fighter after... He, 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 I mean, he came into the UFC super early. Mm-hmm. Um, was it 20 years old? 19, 20 years old. And uh, took his losses. But since that McGregor fight, there really hasn't been, outside of maybe Khabib, a fighter that's been on a tear like him. Uh, and Tony Ferguson, I should Tony say. Tony Ferguson, Tony yeah, Ferguson as well. Say, yeah. But this guy, he's made massive strides in his game. People have said when he got the belt, um, was it Anthony Pettis? I think he got the interim belt. It was. Mm. And then he went on to face Aldo. People have been kind of doubting him, moving up into these bigger fights. I mean, before that, he was beating Oliveira. Look what Oliveira's doing right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeremy Stevens, as tough as it gets. Cub Swanson, back in 2015. Yeah, Cub Cub then is a killer. But you look at the list of guys Holloway fought. He didn't fight no one that was a bomb. He he fought killer after killer for a long time. Yeah, and he was going into people's backyards. He was going into... uh, He's coming over to Sweden. He was was going to... um, He 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 would go anywhere for fights. He'd go into Toronto. He's a big big fan of the Canadian folks now. He is. He's hockey and all that, yeah. He is one of the nicest guys as well, Max Holloway. Jeez, oh, I, he, he just gives off a vibe and energy about him that's uh, radiant and, and really pulls you in. You really want to kind of cheer for the dude. But like I say, once he moved, uh, once he got that fight with Aldo and he, he smashed Pettis, he, like he smashed Anthony Pettis, once he got in the Aldo fight, he, you could see he was there and he was meant to be there um, and destroyed Aldo over two fights. Uh, like I said earlier on, Aldo, I thought I thought he made a few adjustments in the second fight with Holloway, but I think the, the guy in the UFC who can adapt more to anything is uh, is um, Max Holloway. Holloway. Yeah, Max Holloway. Now you've got a guy here. I've seen some people say that um, like this is an upgrade from Frankie Edgar. Frankie Edgar had nothing for Max Holloway, nothing nope. at all. Uh, when people keep asking questions of this guy, um, Ortega, he destroyed him. Aldo mm-hmm. destroyed him. Went up to Pori, faced Pori at 155. I thought he gave as good as he got. I thought it was a really close fight against a really tough guy in Pori. But Edgar is your pressure boxer to, to get into your pressure, pressure wrestling. The only difference I see with him and Volkanovski, I think Volkanovski has really, really heavy hands. I think he's got the power to maybe get the respect of Max Holloway that Frank Edgar could never ever do that. So, um, yeah, Volkanovski is going to want to come forward, he's going to want to pressure uh, Max Holloway, try and get him against the cage and maybe try and dive for legs, try and see if he can get takedowns, work on um, his conditioning and so on and try and wear him down kind of over the 25-minute the period of the fight. For me, I just struggle seeing that. I think he has to really get his respect with his striking. If he can somehow curtail what Max Holloway does with his striking, then I think that um, that's when he can start having success. But if you've got Max Holloway, if he starts to figure you out and he gets what um, tendencies you start doing, 
then you're in big trouble. He's going to because I think he can out to box you. I just think he's far too good with his with his feints, his his angles, and he's just going to he's going to put on he's going to beat you up, and that's what he does with guys. He beats guys up, and he will happily do it over twenty five minutes. That's why he's been a decision. But if he gets the opportunity to finish you, he will do it. And if you give him if you give him the confidence, say, look, I'm going to take this guy out like he did Ortega, then then that's that. So uh, I've got Volk, uh, I've got. Um, Okay. I've got Max Holloway. Um, I don't know whether he stops him though. I think Volkanovski is tough, so I'm going to go uh, Max Holloway with a decision. Well, let's not forget that Volkanovski's not had a five round fight yet. Yeah, but well, he hasn't. I think he's had in the past. He's been scheduled for that. So he had a three rounder against Aldo. Max Holloway, yeah, and that was it. And now in the Aldo fight, you got to remember Aldo was super shy and pulling the trigger. Didn't really pull the trigger too much against Volkanovski, and I was a bit perplexed about that because there was many times when he was standing face to face, and Aldo was not interested in doing that. And I thought, well, that, you deserve to lose that because he just did. Aldo looked like a it looked like an off day for Aldo. He mm -hmm. just did not look good at all because you were just thinking, dude, Volkanovski is there to be hit. He is hittable. Volkanovski likes to throw the big power shots, clincher, grinder against the cage, and then it breaks and reset. Aldo's got, he's, he's what, about five inches taller? So his height, reach, all that advantage kicking in for Aldo straight, Holloway straight away. Holloway can fight off the back foot with jabs and straights all day long if he wants to. Um, Volkanovski's going to have to deal with that high output. He's Volkanovski's not fought anyone yet either who's been throwing that many shots at you. He hasn't fought someone who stands there and throws, you know, 100 strikes in you know, within a round. He, he's not fought anyone like that who throws a, a constant barrage. And Holloway's got fantastic conditioning. Volkanovski, I'm not saying he's got bad conditioning. I'm sure he can go the 25 minutes. It's not that easy, though, to go 25 minutes when you've got someone throwing punches at you for 25 of them. It's all good bit when you're the aggressor, when you're, when you're coming forward and you're applying the pressure. But when there's pressure coming back, and I think Holloway's not going to be scared of it. He, he'll know that Volkanovski has the power and punches, and I think Holloway just has to be smart with the jabs and punches, keep him on the straights. And he did it in the Ortega fight. I think the Ortega fight's going to be, it's going to be similar to the Ortega fight because you've got to remember, Holloway didn't want to stay clinched up with Ortega too much because of the takedown threat, the grappling aspect. And so Holloway made sure he made an effort to keep him on the end of his punches. Same applies here with Volkanovski. The goal is to keep him on the end of the punches rather than let him come in. I have no question that Volkanovski was shooting in for a takedown. Whether he gets a takedown, I don't know, because Holloway's got a bad takedown defense. He's not too bad at it. He's, he's pretty good at defending it. He's pretty good at reading it because he can keep you so he can keep you far away that when you shoot in for the takedown, you're coming from a distance, so he's got a bit of time to defend. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with you, Will. I'm going with uh, the man himself. Uh, Mr. Max Holloway. I think he can get decision win. I think he can come away with this with the belt and yeah, just keep on being the go. I think Volkanovski. There's he fought a Chad Mendes who'd had one fight since coming back from suspension, had one foot out the door already. So and he looked awful. Mendes did in that fight. He didn't even look that good. Didn't perform too great to the Mendes we used to know. Aldo looked super gun shy. I think. Aldo, I, I bet Aldo was gagging to get that match back because I think he, that was probably one of the worst fights I've seen him have. But I'm going to go with Aldo, uh, Holloway here. He's just fought such a crazy line of killers. He's so calm in those situations. You know, it's a big step for Volkanovski. Big lights, big big bright lights, big belt in the line. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, Kamaru Usman against Colby Covington, UFC welterweight championship of the world. There's been a lot spoken about this matchup. Let's get straight into it. Go for it. Let's make America great again. Um, with the man himself, Colby Covington, coming up the face. Kamara Usman now. Colby's going to call himself the interim champ, which I think he kind of is. It's just the way Dana White hates him. But there's a lot to this fight because Usman fought Tyron Woodley, fought really well. It wasn't the most exciting fight. Let's all put it out there. It wasn't a great fight. It was a very good game, a great game plan, but stylistically and aesthetically, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, an uber exciting fight. I think Usman hurt Woodley once in that fight when he tried to throw a barrage of strikes, and he and he missed a lot of them punches. Then he kind of went into like try to finish the fight and was not landing that many shots in, and 
I was really frustrated by Tyron Woodley. I thought, dude, if you just throw one of those strikes dead center and land on Usman, Usman's going to take a step back and it would get the pressure off. But it was just, Woodley was so tentative to throw punches because of the takedown that Usman was able just to come in and close him down and get the takedowns in. Now, on the other foot, Colby did the exact same thing with Robbie Lawler. Well, Robbie Lawler was super tentative, didn't want to throw the big power punch because oh, Colby was coming in with the takedown. This fight is, it, they're, just, they're just the same. It's stylistically very similar. Conditioning for the pair of them, sup, stup, stupendous. You know, Colby's got a great gas tank, so is Kamara Usman. I actually think Colby's got a slightly better gas tank because if you can throw 500 bloody punches in a fight, and get takedowns in. That's a bloody good showing, um, and I think that I, I'm going to actually go with Colby in this fight. I think the striking is going to be the one that lends me towards the winner of this, because you've got to remember the fight starts standing, and if I'm Colby, I'm going to want to keep it standing as long as I can. I think he can win it on a points basis with the striking. He can just throw those pit pat punches at Usman all day long. Drive Usman up the goddamn wall. Usman shoots in from a distance. Colby gets the sprawls. Reset. Off you go again. I wouldn't even bother exchanging on the ground. I'd just stand up and just keep doing it. Um, I've, I don't think there'll be as much wrestling as you think it will be. Because a pair of them will read each other really well. They'll know the takedown attempts are coming from each other. So I think it'll be a lot of feints for the takedowns to, to set up strikes. You might see more takedown based stuff when they're clinched up on the cage. Maybe trips and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Colby on this one. Cause I, I, oh, pff, mate, I feel like vomiting every time I say it. Because take away the per WWE persona. As a fighter, I'm annoyed to say that Colby's done really good. Like, so well. Like, he, he is... You can't take it away from him. Kamara Usman done the exact same thing. I said Kamara Usman would win a title. I think he'd be a champ, a future champ, and I do. But I think Colby could actually win this. I think Colby's got incredible gas time, hell of an output on the feet with the striking, and he can wrestle as well. One thing Kamara Usman lacks on is the striking aspect. He has a bit of striking, but I don't think... He can't put out the... I don't think he could strike as many punches as Colby does and do the wrestling bit. I don't think Kamara Usman's style is that. Kamara Usman likes to throw kind of heavy punch here and there. I think Colby's going to win it with the striking, mate. I really do. Sounds weird, but I think he'll do it. Decision, by the way. But I hate saying that, I know. I'm going to pick Colby Covington as well. <laughs> Which is... Like... Um, I honestly... I, I, I'm kind of baffled at myself that I am because I, I've, I've said for the longest time... I put a video early insight in my channel and I've I've said for years that Kamara Usman is the guy mm -hmm. for that division. I said so. <laughs> and when I watch back and what I see, I think it's actually Colby Covington and it bains me to say it. It really hurts me to say that because I like I said, I've been saying Kamara is the guy that's gonna he, he's gonna beat everybody in that division. But Colby Covington like I said, like you said, put all the gimmicks to the side. Guy's an amazing fighter, mm -hmm. an amazing fighter who can mix it up um, with his like. Obviously, he's a D1 wrestler. You've got D1 against D2, mm -hmm. so you would think that Colby would have the advantage there. But they're, they're kind of two different kind of grapplers. You've got Colby, um, who's he'll get more kind of technical takedowns, where mm -hmm. Usman will be more power based emphatic takedowns, big slams, like it like yeah. a really fight where you'll get Covington who'll use his striking to get in on the hips mm. and take the fight to the ground. Uh, it might not last there for very long, you might not do too much with it. Pop back up, he'll take him back down again. Um striking wise, I think he he's not a full I don't think he's got all that much power as Covington. No. He uses like fifty, sixty percent shots to really just get in on the hips and get your takedowns. But he will throw and he will throw and he will throw to the nth degree. He really will um, and it, I think the big thing in this fight, I think the strikes out in the open, I think Kobe's got an advantage. I think in the clinch, I think Usman has the advantage there. I think the big thing in this fight is the conditioning and maybe maybe all the kind of mental war games that Kobe's been playing on Kamaru. I think 
I think Kamaru is more invested in this fight. He, he might make more mistakes because of this and who he's against. He might get more aggressive. He might gas himself out a little bit quicker. He might be depleted a little bit more because of this. Um, I think the first two rounds are huge. I think if Colby can survive what Kamaru's going to throw, because I'm interested to see who takes the back step first. Because Colby's known for coming out very, very quickly, getting in your face uh, and putting you against the cage and getting takedowns straight off the bat. Like, and he surprises people with that. He keeps on going for five minutes, five minutes. And you can see in some previous fights, you look at the Day fight, the fourth round, I mean, Day took him down like two, maybe three times. Um, that's maybe because he's maybe not taking a break. I don't think that's maybe just he was changing up and Colby wasn't expecting that. But I kind of believe we're both sitting here or where we are. We're both picking Colby Covington over Kamara Usman because I think we're speaking to Usman in Glasgow mm. three years ago regarding yeah. Colby Covington, saying how he would absolutely beat him with an nth degree. And you sit there and you kind of agree with him and you want that to happen. I would, I want Kamara to win this fight. Mm. I really do. I would really want him to win this fight because it might just stop the shtick with Colby altogether. And it's just, that's the one thing I don't like with Colby, it's just the whole shtick. Some yeah. of the things he says, Matt Hughes, even though Matt Hughes has did some bad things in his time, but Glenn Robinson, who's died, and he's mm-hmm. don't, please don't speak about him. Um, and he's a little bit racist with some things as well. I'm just like, nah, that's not for me. But as a fighter, whew, what a fighter this guy is. I think his condition is going to be the, the big factor in this fight. So I've got Colby Covington via decision as well. Um, so that's interesting. So, yeah. Um, so that's done for two forty-five. I'm going to quickly go through. I've got one bet. I really haven't got anything else that I've I've liked the look of um, this week so far. Um, but my my bet that I have I have a parlay. Peter Yan minus four hundred. Max uh, Holloway minus one sixty-three for plus money. That's where I'm at with with my bet that I have this week. Um, Covington's a, a decent underdog. He's plus one sixty five over here in the UK. That's a what's, good... what's Marlon Moraes? Uh, minus two hundred. So a parley piece if you decide to use him. Yeah. That's only going to go up if Aldo has a, a botch of a weight cut. Yeah. And you could do Marlon. What, yeah, what, what that, would Marlon see, and? Yeah, yeah. See, I'm scared with that fight that Aldo has such a bad weight cut that they just cancel the cut. Fight. Yeah, I think they'll cancel the fight potentially. So, as well, yeah. um. But Marlon Moraes, you could put in there with maybe a Mike, uh, uh, Jeff Neal, and get close to plus money or around mm. plus money there. So, yeah, there's nothing really too much. I was thinking about maybe betting Daniel Tamer. He was an underdog. I don't want to really bet that fight. Um, What's Vieira and Aldana? Vieira's minus 165, plus 145 for Aldana. Okay, not bad, not bad. So, yeah, but um, that's not too much I'm really liking. Right? It, might, it might change as the week goes on, but mm. like I say, that's the only one I've got so far. But... Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to have many bets for this card. I need to wait and see a little bit. Uh, maybe Moreno. M- Moreno might be one that jumps out to me. Um, Pajota as an underdog as well. So maybe either one of them ones I might bet as well. But yeah, I have one bet. So guys, uh, let us know what your bets are going to be for this card. Um, let us know what your picks are going to be. Are you on the Usman side? Are you on the Covington side? Are you on the Holloway side? Are you on the Volkanovski side? Let us know what your opinions are on this upcoming fight card. It's going to be a really, really fun card to end of pay-per-views for 2019 from myself John we'll be back next week for uh, UFC in uh, Busan South Korea with a Korean zombie against Frankie Edgar now uh, and then like I say we're going to do a live kind of chat thing towards the end of the year so hit that subscribe button come join the, uh, the huddle and uh, we will see you next week for some more predictions all the very very best <laughs>